I'll see you. What's hey. up, man? How you doing? Dude, this is our first time talking. I've seen you a lot, but I'm excited yeah, this to, to talk to you. Uh, I, I thought we were going to wind up going against each other or something in speed debate, but then you had to get cut out. So, Hey, it's part of it. So um, I I don't know if you saw my first installment of the Change My Mind. Yeah, it was did you? abortion, right? Yeah. So basically, um, I don't know if you saw Crowder's videos, but um, he did a series of Change My Mind where it was a topic where he was more open minded to having his mind changed and let let people hear it's not about winning or losing. It's it's about convincing and conveying i guess um so for me i believe christianity to be true um i love c.s lewis's approach to it where he was i don't know how much you know about him but he was a very staunch atheist tried to disprove christianity um ultimately he believed that he failed to and so the conclusion he came to was well this must be true if you've read um his book mere christianity um was was a huge reason of why i became one wait can can you talk i didn't hear you Oh, I, I said, yeah, I read it. Okay, I, I was just making sure you didn't cut out. Um, and so for me, I love um, one thing that I love about my belief in Christianity is I believe that Christianity can be disproven factually. Um, I believe that the core crux around um, Christianity is Jesus is resurrection. So it is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies of who he is, um, that he died on the cross and rose from the grave. I believe that if you if he did not rise from the grave, then you can make a very solid argument that he is not who he says he is. Um, therefore, um, the core crux of his beliefs are untrue. So I definitely believe in Jesus as liar, lunatic, or Lord. Um, uh, hold on, hold on one second. No worries. Hey. I'm busy right now. Gosh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so I the the idea that Jesus is either a liar saying he isn't who he says he was, he's crazy he didn't know what he was saying or he is who he says he was and so that's kind of the core crux of my beliefs um i'm interested to see why where you stand on this and and, de and definitely like what what your thoughts are sure so i was uh christian both protestant and or catholic both of them uh for the majority of my life um I'm, i mean i'm not old i'm 25 but uh I, i've only been an agnostic uh, for about two years now. And for me, I'm not as much anti-theism or anti-religion as I would simply say, if there is to be belief, there should first be enough uh, proof. And so it's interesting that when you talked about C.S. Lewis and how he didn't find anything that disproved Christianity, I would actually say that he was looking at the wrong, look, looking at that backwards. Because in order to put belief in something, you have to say, okay, there's reason to believe this. So the natural position would be to start with skepticism. So um, just so I'm confirming is like the burden of proof lies on, on Christianity of proving its existence, sure, or not or disproving it as, as okay. Right. Yeah, I, yeah, I just yeah, on, on any religion that claims to be true, you would have to show, okay, here are the fundamental claims that we make. And you mentioned one of them, which was Jesus, but there's actually two others. I'll mention that in a moment here. But, um, so you would, you'd need to prove the fundamental claims of that religion, and you'd need to show what sets that religion apart from any other uh, religions that make the similar sorts of claims. What is it about one specific religion that makes it accurate? Um, so there are three uh, basic claims that Christianity makes that I think would have to be proven true in order for Christianity to be true. Uh, and they'd be, uh, number one, uh, God is the sovereign, all-loving, omnipotent, omniscient, perfect creator, and current ruler of the universe. So they mainly focus on God the Father. Uh, number two would be Jesus Christ, and you talked about this, Jesus Christ uh, became man and died for the salvation of the world, that he is the Son of God and is God himself. So that kind of takes into account the Trinity and the Trinity Christ himself, yeah. Um, and then the third would be that the Bible is the divinely inspired word of God. 
if those three points are proven to be accurate, then Christianity would be proven to be accurate. Uh, but if they aren't shown, then Christianity is either unproven or inaccurate. And if it is unproven or inaccurate, then the, the logical perspective would be agnosticism. And OK, so uh, before I make any arguments against uh, religion, I want to just mention this. I would say if someone cannot prove to maybe not 100 percent certainty, but at least to a really like reasonable degree of certainty that their claim is accurate, then the correct position would be agnostic theism. You could say we do not know if Christianity is accurate, but I choose to believe it. So that would be agnostic theism. And for me, I, I would say that's different than theism or Christianity itself, because in you're not ways. saying I know. Was that in what ways? Well, for instance, it, it, when you say God is truth or Jesus is truth, that's a very different statement than saying, I don't know if God is truth, but I think it, I think it makes sense. And, I, I, and I'm going to believe in it because I don't have a different option. I think that's a very different perspective. So yeah, yeah, I, I, I can see that next to me. So for me, looking at it is Christ made some very bold claims of that I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Um, so uh, it's great that you know a lot about Christian theology, so we can really dive into this. But um, the whole idea of the gospel is innately in Adam's original sin. We have um, been born into sin with an inclination towards sin. When we commit sin, we are imperfect. Um, and therefore, when we die, God has to judge us as sinful. And therefore, we go to hell. Now, um, as you all know, God, uh, the, God's original plan was for all kind of all that to happen. It's if there is a God that given that like he thinks on a level that we can't understand anyway but um that's not a crux of an argument in any way but well i mean the way, the way I, I i will want to follow up on that in a moment here so go ahead and finish your thought on that um so the way that then christ came down lived the life we couldn't died the death we deserved so that when we believe in him and accept his word as truth he will grant us grace. So Martin Luther's uh, Luther Rose of grace alone, faith alone, word alone, through Christ alone, um, that we do nothing to save ourselves, but it is um, Christ's unconditional grace that is that is in saving us. Now, for me, what proves Christianity to be true is the resurrection. Now, this is the, it is the crux of Old Testament prophecies towards the Messiah of is of him rising again and it is an ultimate show of jesus being who he says he is oh you just cut out yeah i did um can you still hear me yeah i can still hear you okay i'm gonna reload this and see if it'll do anything all right You see me again? Welcome back. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so uh, you were talking about the resurrection. How? Yes. Yeah, so yeah, so yeah. Christ, Christ's resurrection and ascension into, into heaven is something that I believe is a core, not necessarily like it is a core doctrine of Christianity that he did rise from the dead, but it is also a core prover of Christianity. Um, I believe that that doing a proof of Jesus is rising from the dead is a great show that okay hey Chris, like jesus is who he says he was therefore using kind of like a step-by-step -step logic of like these claims he made are true this is true then i believe that you can make a proof towards christianity okay so um i used to use the resurrection and madman liar lord as my arguments as well here's what i ultimately came to, which told me, I don't think I can really use those arguments as much anymore. Um, so with Madman Lyra Lord, 
the did I just cut out again? You cut out again. Do you want to just go with audio? Yeah, I'll just go with audio. Why not? Okay. Because um, you can still hear me, right? Yeah, I can hear you perfectly. So with Madman Liar or Lord, the problem I have with that is there's a fourth option, which is or wrong. You he could have just been wrong or misinterpreting what he believed about this. Um, or that the people who were hearing him were hearing him wrong and who they believed that this was what he meant when really that's not what he meant. Um, and, and so, I mean, it's, it's not actually a proof one way or the other. Um, and, and then when it comes to the, the resurrection, there's a lot of problems that I have with the resurrection. Uh, the first one is that there's not one witness. There's nobody who actually saw the resurrection happen. So when you call this a proof, it's not a proof because nobody saw it. The only thing they saw was an empty, an empty tomb, which is yeah. not a proof of what actually happened. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, I have, a, I have a couple more points I want to mention. Okay, no, no, I didn't mean it. Um, so uh, the other thing with that is every single account of the resurrection, all four gospels and Acts of the Apostles, all have a different account of who actually saw the empty tomb. In, uh, in, in every single gospel, there's a different number of people. One person, two persons, three persons, four persons, or five persons between the four Gospels and Acts of the Apostles. Every single one is a different story of how they came to the tomb and found that Jesus wasn't there. Uh, another problem is that the stone was rolled away. Why was the stone rolled away? The, the, the Christians like to proclaim this as, oh, the stone was rolled away. This is proof that God had uh, resurrected from the dead. But it's not, because if God is actually God— he can go through walls. The only person who would roll away a stone would be a human. Well, so a human couldn't roll away that stone. Well, a, a group of humans could, which is actually where the, the final thing that comes in, which I think is a much more logical explanation for this. In, uh, I believe it's Matthew, he talks about how the Jews were spreading rumors amongst themselves that the Jews, that the, uh, the Christians had stolen Jesus's body. Mm -hmm. And... That would actually seem to be a much more reasonable interpretation of what was seen there, that the Christians stole the body. And, and there's simply no proof one way or the other that would tell you, OK, Jesus definitely rose from the dead. We have evidence of this. There's just as much reason to believe that the Christians stole the body. So you can't call that a proof in and of itself. OK, so um, are you aware of the 500 martyrs? Uh Yes. Well, I mean, I don't, maybe not every single individual one, but well, no, no, but these are five for people watching. These are 500 people who claimed because Jesus did do some teaching after resurrection. If, if you believe that he did. So Jesus went around meeting with disciples, did some more teaching and then ascended into heaven after he gave the great command or the, the great sending of all of his disciples to go and make more disciples. Now, these 500 martyrs are people who went to very brutal and bloody deaths from the Roman government proclaiming that they saw Jesus after his death. Now, um, there are many theories that try and explain wh like why these people went to these deaths. Um, my favorite, and I'm not saying this is a good one, but my favorite is the one they all had a, the same acid trip. Um, and that one's a funny one. But... Um, a lot of the explanations are like Jesus had a twin brother that no one knew about and, or Jesus didn't actually die. He was only mostly dead. The old princess bride joke um, or, or things like that. And I have not seen a convincing explanation of who like who that person was that was walking around after Jesus' death teaching to does to people that knew him before his death and saw him after his death. Can, or what, what, is, what is your theory on that? Well, the first thing that I would say on that is that there is, uh, I, th I believe one of the books, I don't remember which book of the Bible says, and if they were to write about the works that had happened, there would be too many books and uh, to talk about what Jesus had done, right? Do you remember mm -hmm. that passage? I don't remember exactly what it says, but that's basically. Um, right? Yeah, kind of. Yeah, well, where, the thing is, those books actually don't exist. Why, why would, <laughs> the, it, it's funny that, if there was all this stuff that was actually going on, that would seem to be the crux of your argument, your proof. Where are those books? They're not actually out there. So it's well, easy to say, oh, there was a lot of things that were going on, but not a lot of people actually claim to have seen Jesus. 
And the, the other thing that I would point to here is every single religion says that they have martyrs who have seen the proof. And that isn't a reason to prefer one specific religion. Well, okay, so yes, they've seen the they've seen the proof, but like, I, I what I mean is is an explanation for who they saw. What these people who knew these five hundred martyrs who knew Jesus beforehand and saw him afterhand of him talking to them and and preaching in those final moments before ascension. What is an explanation? I I haven't seen a convincing one. So let me first ask, um, I'm not really sure which 500 martyrs you're actually talking about. Who, who are these people? who? Because I've read a lot of ancient texts from the time, and I don't know who these 500 people you're talking about. So are. these were, these 500 were, they're not like, it wasn't like one group at one time. Um, Jesus went to different areas um, after death. Um, Matthew talks about it a little bit. Um, the other gospels mention it too, but that, that he was that they had seen him and like he spoke to them and he appeared to his disciples first, but then he also appeared to some other, some other close followers. Um, and then after, oh, I'm sorry. It was, it was during that time of after Jesus ascension, these people started proclaiming and then going out with this, with this great command. Um, and the Roman government of course was persecuting these Christians and there were five, there were around, it's not exactly 500, of course, but it was around 500 people who, while like went to their executions proclaiming that they had seen Jesus after resurrection. And like, that is what, like, that is what they went to their deaths proclaiming. And you see all the disciples doing the same and things like that. I just, for me, seeing how effective Roman executioners were of Jesus was dead. There's like, I think we can all agree that Jesus died on that cross. Um, yeah, it, just, it makes sense because if a Roman executioner m messed up an execution, he got killed. It was something that Roman executioners were excellent at, at being effective with, but uh, the stone rolled away. I agree. Like God could have just walked through the, the, the stone, but it, it sets a better image almost. I, I think that, 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 and then we also have to, one thing that I find interesting, I don't know if it's an argument, but. Uh, most of the Gospels agree that Mary um, Magdalene was one of the first people to see the stone roll away. Um, and she was the one who went and made this account. Yep. Well, this is a very, at the time, this is a very patriarchal society where right. women's right. word was worth well, a lot less. Yeah, if they say something wouldn't have seemed like a conclusive proof. So why would they claim that? Right. What do you mean? Uh, for a woman to, for, for, for a religion to base its uh, proof off of the testimony of a woman uh, is not something they would make up because nobody would have believed the testimony of a woman, right? Yeah, that, that's kind of that's kind of a huge argument. Is well, they would have picked Peter or, or someone else to make the vision because the the voice of a man at that time would have carried a lot more weight. Um, they could have gotten the word out a lot better, and so I think that that in and of its own is is a pretty good convincer um, of it, but. All right, so um, I will simply say that a lot of these things, uh, I would agree that they seem like po like good possibilities. They make a lot of sense, but none of them are conclusive proof. None of them are even remotely close to conclusive proof, especially since you have other explanations for every single one of them. There could have been another person who looked like Jesus who was walking around at the same time. The Jews could have stolen the body. There's a lot of different explanations that could have explained these things. So you don't make as much sense. So you're, yeah, they don't make as much sense, and that's fine. Uh, so it, it, I'm not saying it's wrong to believe in Christianity. But oh, yeah. from the perspective of uh, my, like my perspective here of just agnosticism, it's not proof. I, I mean, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's a good thing that would say, okay, this seems like a reasonable thing to believe in, but it isn't enough to go, okay, this is truth. Right. Um, so then I would, then I, so, so the resurrection and Jesus itself is a good point and like a point forward, but it isn't enough on its own. So that's why I would I say that there are three things that would have to be proven. Yes. Yeah, so you're, you're God three. overall, Jesus, and then the Bible. So I want to just talk about God overall, uh, because God, the whole idea of Christianity is that He is all loving, omnipotent, omniscient, and perfect. Mm -hmm. But the problem with that is that there are a lot of contradictions included within those things. For instance, when you talked about uh, the beginning of the earth. 
when God created Adam and Eve and that there was this plan for what was going to happen with them, right? Why, and, and I've asked this in a couple of debates before, but why would God have put the apple in the garden? God, with his infinite foresight, knows exactly what's going to happen before it even happens. Mm-hmm. So he very easily could have not put the apple there. But he did put the apple there, knowing full well that it was going to cause them to act. Mm-hmm. Um, and and it, it's, we could talk about like free will and everything. But the thing with this is, this is immediate. He knows that immediately after, within a week, this is what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. So it's it's not like we can say uh, God didn't set this up. He specifically set it up so that humans would fall and so that we would then be uh, in a state of sin for the rest of eternity. This also has a problem because we talk about hell. When people go to hell, <laughs> hi, Terrence. <laughs> uh, Terrence is commenting. He says he has to do it. <laughs> He's got to watch. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so and I've used this argument to Terrence before, so I'm sure he's heard it before. But uh, when it comes to hell, mm-hmm. God knows in advance which one of us are going to go to hell. But so he's you, still- you, you subscribe to the doctrine of predestination, correct? Uh, to a certain extent, it's predestination, but it, it's, it's only predestination in the sense that God knows with his infinite foresight. It's yeah. not that he's making us go to hell because supposedly we still have free will and everything, but... He also set the apple there so that we wouldn't actually use our free will. I mean, it's it, it's it's testy and everything, but, uh, yeah, but yeah. The, the reason I want to mention the hell thing is simply this. If God knows before he makes people the ones who will go to hell, he should not make those people. When he does, he is creating people who will suffer everlasting torture. When Jesus was, uh, when, when, uh, he was betrayed at the last supper. He said it would have been better that the man who dips his fingers into the cup, it would have been better that he had never been born. Well, Jesus is God. God already knows it would have been better for that person never to have been created. God is creating people who will suffer everlasting torture, and he knows that. It would be better not to make those people in the first place or to make them better so that they don't make such decisions. And that's just my overall thing here. I think that it's possible that there is a Christian God, but I don't think we fully understand what's going on here if it is the Christian. Well, I don't think we ever will fully understand because at some level, and and this is me kind of admitting that, is on some level we do not, if there is a God in general who thinks on an infinite timeline and things like that, he obviously thinks on a higher level than we can ever fully, than we are capable of comprehending. So we have to accept that, but I'm not trying to use that as a crutch um, in any way. The way I look at it is, is Adam's fall. So God created man knowing we would fail. I agree to that. I think, I think God definitely, like, he created man and he knew that, that we, would, we would sin and we would fall. But he still... He wanted life to be created. He gave us the choice. We made the choice. The, the Adam's Adam's choice is on him. It's not on God. God put the Adam and told him, "Don't." Adam could have because he had free will more so than we do at that time because of the original the curse that bef- befell on Adam. He had more free will than we do to not eat of that fruit. Well, actually, let me let me follow up on that. If yeah, absolutely. You make, if you make a thinking robot, or if you make something with emotions and everything and it can think for itself and you make it in a way that is so flawed that it's going to do bad things are well, you did not make that man inherently flawed what you did not make man inherently flawed he made them <laughs> within 10 minutes they were going to be inherently flawed i mean seriously god knew exactly what was going to happen immediately so he didn't make them inherently flawed. It's just a technicality that says that he didn't because they hadn't eaten the apple yet. But it was within a, it was within a couple of days that they did. Yes, but he did not make them. So, so here's the thing. God, uh, Adam is definitely the original definition of a blank slate of he is who he makes himself to be. Now, God did not make him eat of that fruit at all. He did not force him to do that. He, but he God had him better to the point where he would not have chosen such a thing. What? 
But God, God makes us with our inclinations. He could have made Adam and Eve in a way that they would not have been so inclined to choose sin. So well, yeah, he, did, he made them with no inclination. He, he made them with no inclination. The Bible, Genesis is very clear that, that they, they were created perfectly in the eyes of God and that they did not have the inclination towards sin, but they chose sin. So, so right now, humanity has an inclination towards sin of like, it's kind of like a, biblically, it's kind of like a ramp like this of where you're like, we can choose good, but ultimately we have an inclination towards evil, that original depravity of man. Adam was not born with that depravity. He was not created with that depravity. He was created with the free will to choose sin, but he was not created with the inclination towards sin. That is, the Bible makes that very clear. But he was, but he did have the inclination towards eating the apple, <laughs> which God he, could. He very chose easy. to eat the apple, but he did not have that inclination towards sin because, because if you look at it, Satan interjected himself and convinced Adam. Now, okay, it, it, why did Satan exist? Why did God make Satan? Why, why would why would he make Lucifer? That's something that I will never understand. Um, that doesn't but, seem like the idea of this all-loving, all-perfect God. Why would you create the being who is going to tempt all of your creation and take them away? Why would you do that? Especially since Satan fights with God's angels and takes half of them away. God knows that. Why make him in the first place? That's just a terrible way of designing it. Again... I don't really have, a, a, I don't want to be honest with you, I don't have a true counter to that because I don't know. And I don't think, I don't think either of us really have an answer to that. No. I think we have conclusions about that, but I don't think we have an answer to that because at the end of the day, like, we'll, we will not have all the answers to that. I, um, I that. So, so I'll definitely weird. concede that to uh, you. Um I guess the way I look at it is when I, when I look at what I have, what we have done, like it, I'll, I'll let it go to you. I, I I'm going to need a second to think. <laughs> no worries. Uh, Terrence is, uh, his, his, my cliff notes version of the Bible. <laughs> um, but, uh, here's the thing. There can be explanations for these things. And one of the explanations is simply this. We do not know the mind of an infinite being. Yeah. We can't know the mind of an infinite being. And that infinite being is necessarily beyond anything we could comprehend. So if I was to say God did it because God is evil, I would not be correct in saying that because I don't know why God would do something. And if you were to say God did it because God is good, I think you'd also be incorrect because you can't actually know that yourself. I think that when we talk about infinite beings, they are necessarily beyond our comprehension. But if that is the case, then I don't think there is enough evidence for us to say, this means God is good. This means everything that Christianity claims is true. We can say that seems like a possibility, which would be agnostic theism. But that's very different than the idea that God is necessarily proven and that Christianity is necessarily proven. I think that ultimately gets into, and we can get into the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit, it, it, as the Bible explains, works within us. So um, a, a good um, John Piper um, made some good analogies to the Holy Spirit as um something that lifts our blinders that because of our in, innate depravity, we are incapable of seeing the truth or biblical truth. But then when the Holy spirit is filled within us, it kind of lifts those blinders up and then we are able to see truth and then we accept truth. So I think on a level it's, I genuinely believe that the Holy spirit is real and that the Holy spirit, it has shown me truth that I can't explain. And so I think there's also a supernatural element to this that is element that is important to belief. And I'm interested to see what, like your given your views on agnostic theism, how you view the Holy Spirit. Yeah, no, good question. Um, I would agree that there probably, well, here's what I would definitely agree. There are things in this world that are beyond our understanding. There, mm -hmm. 
a, a very good explanation of that would be that there's a spiritual realm. And I think that every single religion, to a certain extent, has some piece of that spiritual realm. That's why you see miracles in every single religion, not just Christianity, not just Buddhism. And certain religions access different elements of that spiritual realm better than other religions. And Christianity is one of the better ones that seems to have a lot of these martyrs and a lot of these miracles that are going on. But they don't have all of it. There are a lot of problems and contradictions that are still involved in Christianity. And there are a lot of problems and contradictions that are still involved in Buddhism or in Mormonism or in Islam or any other religion. Mormonism is its own, to me, it's in its own realm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one of my Mormon friends, is uh, he, he keeps trying to get me to, uh, to read the whole Book of Mormon because I've read the Bible a few times and I've read uh, the Quran once. And he's like, now you got to read the Book of Mormon. Like, All right. <laughs> Eventually. Uh, but anyway, the point is there, there's different ways of tapping into that spiritual realm. And perhaps the correct answer to that is that it's the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit is guiding us on this, on this path. Or perhaps it is uh, a different religion's interpretation of how to access that spiritual realm. The point is, I think that if there are things in this universe that are beyond our comprehension, we can't claim one individual religion has all the answers, especially when those religions have many contradictions within themselves. So I think that we can. I think that there, I believe that religion is an objective thing. So like either Christianity is true or it is not. Either Islam is true or it is not because they in and of themselves make very exclusive claims. So Christianity, you have Jesus saying that he is the only way to salvation Islam, they say a lot of things um, in the Quran. I've read it as well. It, and so they they talk about theirs being an exclusive way to salvation. Um, Judaism talks about it being an exclusive. So when, when every single one of these religions are claiming exclusivity, I think on a level, well, then, yeah, one of these has to be true. And so I think for me personally, when I became a Christian, I weighed different religions and I looked at founders of religions and doctrines and things like that. And then I logically came to like, well, I don't think that there is no God because that doesn't make any sense to me. And Christianity meets standards that make sense for the most part. Like it, it, you know, if you look at like the life and teachings of Jesus versus the life and teachings of Muhammad or the life and teachings of Joseph Smith and things like that, and, and there's a huge different character. They're, they're very, Jesus is very different from those other people. I mean, yeah, I would agree. I think that when I read uh, the words of Jesus, I am mostly, uh, I, I mostly have a positive opinion of anything he says. That being said, if you read the Bible and just listen to his points, he doesn't actually say a whole lot. There's, there's not actually a lot that Jesus, as quoted in the Bible, actually says. He's, basically, it comes down to love others and give up your worldly possessions. And basically, all of his points stem from those two points. Um, so I, well, it's like the, when he was asked about the most important commandments, and he said, like, honor, um, love, love your neighbor as yourself, and then also, like, have no other gods before me. Right. Yeah. And, and, and to a certain extent, I think that uh, that basic frame of mind is kind of what all of his points come down to. And, and they're good points. And I think that what you see with the works, or at least from what we know of Jesus, he appears to have been a very good person. But I find it difficult to say that we as humans can say this is true. We might be able to uh, believe something is true. And, and that's why I don't, I don't mind when Christians say, I believe this. Mm -hmm. I have faith in this. I don't mind that. But what I do have an issue with is when any religion says this is true, as opposed to them saying, I believe it's true. So I do not take issue with that. Um, because again, I believe that it either is true or it isn't. So logically, if you think it is true, you're going to say it is true. I like the wording of, I believe this is true because it opens more conversation. Um, but ultimately either Christianity is true and the claims that Jesus made of him being the way to salvation is true or it is not true that, that has to be weighed on a level. So I do not take issue with Christians who say, I believe Christianity is true 
because it it either is or it, it isn't. Well, I mean, there's another alternative there, which is that it's in part true. There could be elements of it that are accessing the truth and that the truth itself would be greater than just what any one religion is saying. And well, yes, but if, if we're talking about exclusivity, Christ claims to be the truth. I'm the truth the way, like, like, like Christ claims to be the truth. So either he is the whole truth or he is not the whole truth. If he claims that he is, you have to take that claim and, and weigh it. If it is proven, uh, then that would be where we come back to the human mind. What is possible to know with the human mind? And through the human mind, we cannot know that which is infinite. We can only know that which is accessible to a human mind, that which is logical, that which is provable. Mm -hmm. And as I think both of us have already mostly agreed. Uh, I, I mean, correct me if you, if you disagree with this, but I, I don't think we can prove the truth of Christianity as much as we can prove that it makes sense. So I, I can agree to that to a level. So I believe that, like, logically, we can make a good case for Christianity being very plausible. Sure. And then I think that the Holy Spirit, like we get here on the level and then with with Christianity being it, like me believing it is true, then the Holy Spirit comes for this other way and takes us to that faith gap. So so that like there is a, an element in every religion that comes down to, OK, we can't understand this. So there is faith. I have faith that it is true. And that's not for me using it as a, cr a crux or a crutch on this It is me simply saying, well, I have, I, there is a certain element that I will never understand. So I have faith that it is true. Okay. So that to me sounds like you're describing a certain level of agnosticism. So on a level, like, yes, there is a level of me, not a hundred percent knowing, but I know for a fact that if you showed me Jesus's corpse, I would stop being a Christian. I know um, things like that. If you showed me irrefutable evidence that Jesus was not who he says he was, I would stop being a Christian. So I believe that Jesus is who he says he was. And I believe this is true. Now there is a certain level that I don't understand and I don't know, but that doesn't mean I don't take it as truth. I think that's fair. Yeah, that, that, that's fair. Uh, I like that you uh, establish that there is something that could have been shown to uh, make you disbelieve it. Cause I know oh. there, there are certain, oh, yeah. people will just yeah. believe it's just faith just faith and that there's no. no level of logic involved if you if uh, and uh, i had an old pastor that says if you gathered all the christian like old theological giants in a room and you were like here is jesus's corpse here's all the evidence that it is jesus's corpse they would all stop being christians um it just it's, it makes sense if, if you have proven me that jesus hasn't risen from the dead he wasn't who he says it was why would i believe this man it, either if he was wrong either if he's a liar lunatic why would i believe that if he was wrong yeah, no, that's that's definitely fair. Um, so I, I could go more into the different contradictions that I see in Christianity itself, but I mean, I don't I don't think we really need to, um, because just as a general overview, I think that it's fair to believe in a religion if you can establish a good logical case for it, and then. Uh, Proof only gets you so far because of the human mind. We are, we are limited by our finite being. Mm -hmm. So then it's just a question of what you personally choose to have faith in. Yep. And that, I mean, it's, that's a very subjective choice. And, and I think that there is something that can be said for uh, most religions. You could subjectively choose pretty much any of them, and it would be reasonable. I don't, I don't, there's some I would argue that aren't reasonable, but yes, yes. Well, yeah, I, I think that's fair. <laughs> but, but at, at least to a certain level, you can certainly make a case for most of them, particularly Buddhism, I think is the one that most I think you can make a case for just because of the effects that it you do see in the natural world. There's more proof of it in the natural world than there is of any other religion. Mm -hmm. But Christianity is probably number two on that list. So it would be reasonable to put faith in that. Yeah, I, I can definitely see that. Um, for me, it's just there have been so many things that I cannot explain in my life and so many things that, that I've seen of either me, call, like, and this is just very personal. This isn't even an argument. It's just I have seen so many things in life where I have called on to God for help and then I have been a, enormously blessed or I have seen people healed 
of diseases that doctors couldn't have been able to cure. Um, and like I did mission, my family did mission work and disaster relief in Nicaragua and Costa Rica for a, a couple of years. And what we saw there was just mind boggling of, of the work that w- was being done that I just don't have an explanation for, but I was doing in that we were doing in the name of Christ. And so to me, like on the level that I can't understand what makes sense to me is, well, that was God working in us. So that's well, just a personal level. I would agree with you that that's possible. Maybe the explanation you're associating that it was God, maybe that's the right explanation. But also every single religion would say the same thing. They would say, oh, I have seen all these things that I could not explain. Therefore, that means that Allah is the one true God. Which is, which is why I don't use it as an argument. Right, yeah, no, I, I understand that. But the other thing that I would say about that too is that you're not associating any of the times you prayed and it didn't work. People just have people have this filtering bias that they notice the things that did work out. And then so, they say, okay, that means prayer works, and that means that the Christian God or whatever God they're proof they're talking about, that means this is the case. But really, if they were actually like uh being objective about it, you would find that the majority of the time when you pray, your prayers are not going to be answered, and that a few of the times when they are answered, it just seems so important. So the question is, is like just looking at from like doctrine of Christianity, are we praying for the right things? There are times where like I've prayed for all lays or things like that. Well, that doesn't make sense for God to give me that. Um, that that's not, I think, I think God answers our prayers. Um, Christian, when it, when it aligns with it, with his plan for us of like, if he's like, no, no, I don't want this for you. I want this for you. So I'm not going to help you down this path that I, that I know isn't right for you. I'm going to help you down this path that is right for you. I think that is ultimately answers the question of like, well, why didn't this prayer work? It's because, well, that wasn't what you needed. It's like, um, I, in, in high school, I wanted to get an internship in engineering to like decide if I wanted an internship. And so I, I worked very hard, but I also like prayed like, God, if this, if this is, your will I'd, I'd love an internship and i got one and then it got taken away from me um because like they couldn't hire minors with their workman's comp and i was like okay well why i find out later that the company was going under and then i got another internship and that one went south and then i got another opportunity for an internship with a company that did work out and then i found out another kid that did get the other internship and he was working in very horrible conditions and I ended up with a really great spot. And so I'm not saying that it was God, but like for me, it was like, OK, this prayer wasn't answered. This prayer wasn't answered. And then I come to find out that, well, those things would have been very bad for me. So I guess that is my answer to like why we don't have prayers answered. Yeah, but God already knew that. He's always known that if God is who y- you and the Christians would say he is with his infinite foresight, he already knew exactly how it was going to turn out. And that's the thing. There's there's a a certain inevitability to life if there is a perfect God. And that Mm -hmm. was where predestination would come in. Um, It's not because he made us do things, but because he already knew what his answer would be. And so I'm I'm not saying that prayer is bad, but I'm just saying that when you talk about these different things and some of them worked out and some of them didn't, to be completely logically fair about that, your mm-hmm. prayers didn't change anything. That's you fair. Uh, well, exactly was going to happen. I, I can definitely see that. Um, for me, that that's totally fair. Um, I think you've opened my mind about a lot of things. I don't know if you've like entirely changed my mind on my beliefs, but like, <laughs> it's just a definitely different look that I'm going to take on things. So I really do want to uh, thank you for having this conversation with me. Um, and I hope we can do more in the time to come. Do you like this this format? Yeah, dude, I, I love it. And, and the thing is, like, I I could have gone full debate mode and everything, um, and just criticize Christianity, but I don't I don't really want to because I, I do I, I think it's perfectly reasonable for people to have faith in certain things. And so I, I like this whole just talk about it and just talk about different ways to look at things. 
That's one thing that I, I, I like call out as a debate site, but I also think there's a level that would be really healthy on here to just have discussion where we're not trying to blast the, the little points the opponent is making or things where we're just having conversations and we're actually trying to maybe convince or open the eyes of another person. So I hope we can do a lot more of these in the future. Agreed, man. And maybe you'll be able to see me next time. Hey, talk to you later. <laughs> Peace, bud.